Somebody says, I'll never get through chapter 4 today, and I think you're right. That's okay. You know, we're, we're all living here, and we'll be back next week to finish up if we don't get today. Chapter 4 begins the third section, if you will, of Revelation. Remember the first two sections? One's what John saw. He saw in heaven, you know, this type deal of what the Lord revealed to him. Chapter 2 and 3 was what is now, and that's the, that's the seven churches. And that is where we're living at now. It's what is now, okay? Again, in chapter 4, chapter 4 and 5 and 6 and run on down the line. Again, in chapter 4, it's what is to come, the third section of Revelation, okay? Uh, what is to come here, chapter 4 and 5, is what, is what John is going to see as far as what are things that are happening in heaven. Beginning in chapter 6, from chapter 6 of the end of the book, it's talking about things and events that are going to happen on earth itself, okay? So we're going to first see the you know, next two chapters, basically, of you know, to see what the you know, Lord reveals to John in heaven itself and you know, that type of deal, okay? Uh, chapter 4, verse 1 says, After this I looked, and there before me was the door standing open. In heaven, and the voice I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. Basically, he's talking about here when he's talking about this after this, after this, beginning the end of that verse, he's talking about after the things that are happening, after what he had seen in chapter 2 and 3 of the churches. After that period of time is what he's going to talk about and reveal to John what is going to happen in the last half of the last third part of this uh, revelation to see the events going to happen from the time basically from the end of the church age whenever that is and we don't know when that is okay we know that we're in the last days of the church you know because prophecies can push fulfill you know all these other things and so on and so on but we don't know when it's going to happen when it's going to officially end except to know that we're officially in to sign the peace accord or the peace covenant if you will okay but we don't know when that is not as not as there yet People's, a lot of people conjecture, for it, well, the Antichrist is already here, so therefore it must be very soon. Don't, don't, don't believe that mess, okay? We don't know whether the Antichrist is here or not. Antichrist will be revealed when he is here and when he is signing the peace accord, where the Antichrist will be revealed at that, po that point in time. We don't know whether he's here, here or not. People say, well, you take his name, it adds up to 666, etc., etc., etc. I, you know, I'm, I'm reading the commentary back oh, several years ago. I was just going to talk this thing. They said, you know, they, there's thousands and thousands of people that's alive today that their name and they add up the Hebrew letters and all adds up to 666. We know there's not thousands and thousands of antichrists. There's only one of the boys, okay? So don't worry about, you know, what that is and this type of deal. But again, it's at the end of the seventh church age, into that, that type of deal. Remember, if we saw, we know in, in the things that we've studied already in the rest of Revelation, if you've studied on through those things, the church is mentioned some 19 times in the first three chapters. Beginning in chapter 4, verse 1, from that point on, the church is never mentioned again as far as dealing with worldly activities and all. So a lot of people take this as a proof or, or you know, that type of deal saying the church has been raptured out. We talked about before, when is the church raptured out? Prior to tribulation. Where prior to tribulation? Nobody knows. From now until the signing of the peace accord. That's when the church is going to be raptured out. But there's a lot of things in here that tells us as these things are happening, beginning in chapter 4, that the church has already been raptured out. One of these they use to say that, to, you know, to prove that, if you will, is the church is never mentioned again. But since the church is never mentioned again, they're taking that as proof of saying the church is already gone. Maybe, maybe not. Okay, but that is you know, part of their proof of doing that. We'll see as we get on down through here, there's a couple of other proofs or pro events that happen that we'll see that does tell us that the rapture's already happened beginning in chapter 4. Okay? But, you know, that type of deal. You just have to look at those. Scripture does not tell us all of this is conjecture. Remember, in all the, you know, so much conjecture on the end time studies and eschatology and all this kind of stuff. Everybody knows exactly what all these things mean and when this is going to happen and so forth and so on. Let me give you a, a truthism right here. Nobody except God himself knows what's, this, what's fixing to happen. Okay? So therefore, don't let anybody tell you, well, we're in the last days. The rapture's going to happen next week or rapture's going to happen November the 13th. I always tell people, hey, I, I, okay, so November the 13th, if the rapture's going to happen, what are you going to do? You know, I mean, yeah, you know, I, whatever. But, don't get there, whatever. I mean, just, just know that basically this time, beginning in chapter 4, is after that time, after this happens, after the church age, okay, 
God is going to show John what's going to happen as he takes him up to heaven. So he'll, he'll be up there. Okay? It says John saw an open door. What a wonderful thing that is. And I said, you know, as I studied this week, and you know, I think there's like four open doors it talks about in Revelation study here. But one of these is so, so great is, you know, that God has opened the door to heaven and he has invited me and you in. We're not going to get there and the door's going to be closed. We're going to have to knock and bang and break and plead and everything else to be allowed in the presence of God. God has that door open for us and we're welcome there when the time comes. When you draw your last breath here, you'll be with God in heaven and that door will be open for us. Okay? Just like John saw here, the open door to reveal to him so that he has, he has access, if you will, to the holy throne of God. And that's what you and I, because of our salvation, we have access to that. Just like John had access here in his, his spirit and in, in things that he did. It says, I told him to come up there. It basically means here, and you see this in the next verse, talks about this is a spiritual movement. This is John is taken up in the spirit, not in the body. John's body is still, still is sitting on Patmos when he's getting all these things, okay? But he has taken up spiritually to see and be in the presence of God so that, you know, he can write these things and put them down for us, okay? Verse 2 says, uh, at once I was in the spirit. Here's where it tells me he's in the spirit and not actually gone up physically, you know, and raptured out of here with body and soul and this type of thing, okay? At once I was in the spirit and there before me was a throne in heaven with someone sitting on it. I just can't imagine going in the presence of God and seeing this throne sitting there. And guess who's sitting on the throne? God the Father is sitting on the throne. What a marvelous thing. What a time of joy. What a time of, you know, just that, you know, God is allowing us to be in his presence. Okay? But John is in there and he is walking, going through the door and he's seeing, seeing God the Father sitting on the throne in heaven. Okay? Verse 3 says, and the one who sat there had the appearance of Jasper and his Cornelia, a rainbow resembling an emerald and circled the throne. Basically, he's talking about here is just basically the brilliance of God. Remember, no, Scripture tells us, you know, nobody can see God. Nobody can be there and see God without dying, you know, this type of deal. So nobody is allowed to see God, but they can see the brilliance of God. They can see the beauty of God, okay? If he, he mentioned here a couple of, you know, you know, a stone talks about jasper. Jasper is like a, like a diamond, clear and beautiful, okay? Uh, the canilla is basically a ruby red, you know, type deal. So these things show the beauty of God in, this, in the beauty of, of colors, if you will, and that you and I can understand and know that God's brilliance is vibrant to us. These also, these two stones mentioned, the canilla was the first, first stone on the breastplate of the high, high priest. The jasper was the last stone on the breastplate of the high priest. So these things show that you know, throughout Scripture, these are used in worship to God. Just like the, the breastplate of the high priest was very much part of the worship of God, and these stones were represented on those things. Okay? Then it says uh, a rainbow resembling emerald. The emerald is green. So we have the green beauty surrounding the throne. But all these things just show us the, the, the majesty of God himself. Even though we can't see him as a person or whatever else, we can experience him. We can experience him in nature if you say enough, if nothing else. We can experience him in the things that we see that God reveals to us each and every day. I hear a lot of people say, well, the Lord spoke to me today. I, yeah, okay. I have no problem with that because I don't know. You know script doesn't tell me either, you know, the Lord, the Lord won't speak to you, you know, that type of deal. I know for me... I've, I've experienced God speaking to me in my thoughts and in my spirit, but the Lord has never come down and said, Marv. So the day he says that, I ain't going to be here the next day when we die, right at that one point, point, okay? I won't be back, okay? You know, but I mean, it, can God do that? Absolutely. He could, okay? But God speaks to us through the things that he provides for us. He speaks to us through the joy that we have every day in living for him. He speaks to us in... I always say our grandkids, because they don't speak to us through our kids sometimes. You know, we have a lot of problems with them suckers. You know, type deal. But anyway, but through our grandkids, he speaks to us through nature, through through sunset. Carol and I many times sit in the afternoon and look out our, our windows in front of our house, which faces to the west, and I'm sitting there going, if you can't see God right there, you're blind. <laughs> Absolutely. Unbelievable. The beauty of God himself in creation. Okay. 
But anyway, so here he's talking about, you know, that, it, that he is there in, in the presence of God and brilliance of God is what we see in basically in chapter, in verse 3. Verse 4 says, <clears throat> Surrounded the throne were 24 other thrones, and seated on them were 24 elders. They were dressed in white and had crowns of gold on their heads. Here is where we talk, start talking about, you know, those things and those proofs, if you will, that talks about this, you know, that the church itself has been raptured out of here. One is it talks about the 24 thrones. It doesn't tell us in Scripture who is sitting on these 24 thrones. It says they got 24 thrones sitting there. That's there, okay? These 24 thrones are sitting around the throne of God, and their whole purpose is to worship God in this type of deal, you know, for these people this year. These 24 thrones, many commentators or, you know, people that you're going to read and all says, well, they're representative of the 12 tribes of Israel in the Old Testament and the 12 apostles in the New Testament. Okay, 12 and 12 out of 24, so you might be right. I have no idea. Scripture doesn't tell me that, okay? It just says you have these 12 thrones, you know, around, around the throne here, around God's throne. It says also on there that they have these 12, these 24 elders sitting on them, okay? These 24 elders, if you go back and go through Scripture and all, we know basically the elders or the leaders of the church or you know, this type deal that, that assisted in the walk each and every day. This was set up by Moses back in the Old Testament. When Moses divided the tribe of, of Levi into 24 different units, if you will, to help lead the church and help in the worship of God himself in the church in, you know, back in that time. So therefore, and they were given through those days and through, through Paul's thing of setting up the church and after it was set up in Pentecost, they were talking about appointing elders. And these elders were to lead in worship and to lead in, in helping the people to become closer to God. So therefore, elder is a human word. You never see anywhere where elder is associated with an angel or a divine being. Elder is always a human person, human being that he's talking about. So one of the reasons of, you know, saying that, you know, the, the, the church has already been raptured out because these people sitting here are elders of the church and they were a hu human being at some point in time, okay? So therefore they've been raptured out and now they're sitting on the throne. Okay, maybe, maybe, maybe not. I, I, not as strong as the next two. The next two things it says here is much stronger as far as saying the church has been raptured out. The next thing that it's talking about here, it said they're dressed, these elders are dressed in white. Throughout scripture, when it talks about dressed in robes of white and all this kind of stuff, it's talking about salvation. It's talking about that this person has been saved and represents salvation that God has bestowed on them, salvation and forgiveness of their sin. Okay? Nowhere in Scripture is angels ever said to be dressed in white. But many times it says through there that, that, that many of us, many of the humans that have been raptured out here, is dressed in white, signifying we are in salvation and living in salvation and we have been taken out of here. Okay? So they are, here is a, the first or another thing that proves or, you know, I guess leads to the point of thinking that the church has been raptured out because now we have these elders, one, sitting on the throne, they're dressed in white, signifying salvation. Angels at this point in time, they have no sin. Now, did angels ever have sin? Yes. Back before creation, and that's those things, when Satan and those, those third of the angels in heaven sinned against God and they kicked them all out of heaven, they had sin in their life. That's why they're called demons. The ones that are left is left here, especially at this point in time where the church is being raptured out. They have, they have no sin, never have had any sin, so therefore they will never be dressed in white. Okay? Because they don't need salvation. The only thing that needs salvation is me and you. Okay? Because why? We have sin in our life and we need to be transformed from the old person to the new person because of what God can do for us. Okay? So therefore, it talks about, make sure I'm not, don't, not get ahead of himself, dressed in white. They have gold, crowns of gold on their heads. There's two, type, two types of crowns talked about in Scripture. There's the diadem crown and the Stephanus crown. Okay? The diadem crown is basically awarded or associated, basically, if you will, thank you for putting that up there. <laughs> the, gold, the gold crown is talking about, basically, the diadem crown is, is talking about royalty or divine, or divine people. Okay? You and I will never have a dining crown. Okay? You and I will have the Stephanus crown. The Stephanus crown basically is set up for those overcomers, 
those that have overcome sin in their life. We know this by scripture, and we talked about back when, you know, we've talked about the crown, the five different crowns is, that's associated with, you know, people when they come to heaven. Uh, we know that God will, will, at one point in time, and that is the judgment seat of Christ, you and I, as we go to heaven, as we come in the presence of God, when we stand for the judgment seat of Christ, our works is going to be judged. And our works is judged. Those works that we do, that's gold and silver, and stand up, those things we do for Christ and the thing for Christ, stand up to test, and we will be awarded a crown for them. Those things that we do that is not of Christ and not for the glory of God, those will be burned up by hay and stubble and wood and so on and so on. All of that will go away. Now, how many crowns you and I are going to get? Don't have any idea. You'll get at least one because of salvation. Will you get the other four or not? It's according to what you do and you know this type of deal. And God talks about in Scripture what those are so what those associated with, what you have to do in order to get those crowns. Do you worry about those crowns? Not me. I worry about what I do for God each and every day. And then if I get a crown, great. If I don't get a crown, who cares? Because we know that, you know, as we are judged, stand for the judgment seat of Christ. For those works that stand the test, we will be given a golden crown put on our head. Here he is saying these elders sitting on the throne is sitting there with golden crowns on their head. Because they're golden crowns and not diadem crowns, they have to be associated and rewarded and given to people because of standing for the judgment seat of Christ. So if these people already stood for the judgment seat of Christ, which will happen after the rapture, <laughs> after the rapture, then we will be awarded those crowns, and those crowns, what is so wonderful about those, and we'll see them again as we get over about verse 9, 10, 11, which will be next week, or that type of deal. But as we get those crowns, we'll have them, God will will award those to us, put them on our head, and then for the rest of eternity, I, I truly believe, I think Scripture tells that, rest of eternity, we're going to spend eternity taking them devils off and putting them before Christ himself as a, as a worship for him. And he talks about it even as we talk, we'll talk about next week. This is a continual thing. This is not a once and forever. We're not going to stand before the throne of God and take the crown off and lay it down and then we leave it there. Scripture talks about this like worshiping God is every day, every minute, for eternity. Therefore, the crowns and laying of crowns before God and worshiping Him is the same way as we'll be worshiping Him in truth and, and you know that type of deal around the front of God. As we worship Him, we'll be constantly, I think, laying those crowns at His feet. In order to do that, we've got to pick them up, put them back on them, lay them back down again. Okay? Now, whether or not you ever get them back on your head or not, I have no idea. But you're going to be continually laying these crowns before God himself for worship of God. Okay, that type of deal. So because of those things, most people believe, most you know, theologians and everything else believe that the church has been raptured out. We're no longer here because they, they're, it's dressed in white. You have golden crowns on. You're called elders. On and on. Never meets it again. So all those things that said, you know, basically as, as John saw here in the beginning of chapter 4, the rapture has already happened. Now, you want to argue that back and forth? No. Scripture never tells you the beginning of chapter 4, Revelation, the rapture's already happened. So if the Scripture doesn't say that, you're guessing. Okay? We can take things and try to, try to prove these things because we know these things happen because of where we are and the things that's happening around us and the things that lead to those things. But you can't prove by Scripture by injecting into and saying because of this, then this happens. If that is true, God would say, the rapture has happened. If he said again in chapter 4, the verse, first verse says, the rapture has happened, and all the, all the saints have gone to heaven, and John saw him sitting on the throne, you know it's true. Okay? Other than that, conjecture. Okay? But again, looking at the scripture, we know that we can you know, best guess of saying who these people are, and that type of deal for us, and that we're already out of here. We're out of here when John sees, this, sees these things. Okay? Well, I got through chapter four, chapter three, ver I'm four, verse four, so that was pretty close, okay? We're only seven verses away being done in chapter four, okay? And all you people that said, Marv, you'll never get through chapter four today, you were right, okay? <laughs> Which is nothing new, right? Yes, sir, go ahead, Dennis. And it talked about the first voice he heard. Who, who spoke to him, do you think? 
I think I think God Himself spoke to him. Okay, because all this you're standing around. He is standing before the throne of God. And now we know that, it, and we know through the rest of chapter chapter four and again in chapter five that all the Trinity of God is in this place and, and associated with this this view or vision that John had. Okay, because the next verse talks about the seven lamps, which is which is the Holy Spirit. But we know this is yes, it is spoken to here, and he is spoken, and he is sitting around the throne of God. I think that is a that is a voice of God Himself that he hears. Okay, that's what I think. Okay, and it doesn't it doesn't specifically say. It just says we heard the voice from the throne. If you hear the voice from the throne, God is sitting on the throne. It's probably the voice of God. Okay. Any other questions, comments? We begin first. Chapter 4, verse 5 next week. And we're trying to get through through chapter 4. But if we don't, the Lord's going to come and the rap's going to be out of here and you can finish up and ask God all the questions you want to about the chapter when you get there. Okay? Father, we thank you. We love you, God. Forgive us in the way we fail you, Father. Help us to be mindful each and every day. That God, we are your example here on earth. People look to us to see Jesus in us. Because we know, God, as we receive salvation from you, that free gift that, that we don't deserve, as we receive, receive that thing, we become a new person. And that new person to reflect Christ each and every day. Father, help us to reflect Christ. Help us to put away the old man or old woman or whatever, this type of deal, the old self, and live for you. Father, we ask you to be especially with our prayers today. We're, there are so many. Father, but one good thing about it, we know you being an all-knowing person, all-knowing God. You know each and every of these, these prayer needs be before we do. And Father, I know by your promises in Scripture that you're already there before we even get here. That is just mind-boggling to me that my needs in my life, I have a perfect God that already knows them before even I do. And you promise you're going to lead us through those things. Whatever it may be. You never promise you're going to heal us here on earth. But you promise we'll be healed. It may be after we, we stand before you to judge and see Christ. But we will be healed. Because we're yours. And you have given us the grace of salvation, Father. And we will live eternity with you with no more pain, no more suffering, no more problems. Thank you, Lord, for being who you are. And thank you, Lord, for being part of our lives. Give us safety and peace and joy. Father, as we live for you each and every day. Bless and keep every person here in your palm of your hands and give them the blessings to which you want to bestow on them. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Love you. See you next week.